Hey everyone, welcome to the Watson Blocks Podcast. The show is brought to you by Giga Energy, a leading electrical manufacturer focused on Bitcoin mining. And I know you guys are sick and tired of me saying this, but if I could ask for a huge favor, if you have not subscribed to the show or given us a rating or review, please take a second and go do that now. It really helps us out. And while you're at it, actually go check out the YouTube channel as well that we just launched. You can now watch all the conversations as well as stay tuned for some of the exciting content that we'll be releasing soon. This week on the show, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Jeff Coates. He is the owner of a one megawatt Bitcoin mining facility up here in the Midwest. We get into Jeff's background of running businesses and how this facility is actually Jeff's retirement plan and how he has right-sized everything just for that purpose. We also talk about the nuances of working with an electrical co-op and what they think of his endeavors. This is one of those episodes that is absolutely phenomenal insight for the folks in the energy industry who might be looking at ways to have a Bitcoin miner on their grid system as a large load customer. At the same time, this is absolutely inspiring for the small Bitcoin miners to hear because we get into some of the nuances in detail about how Jeff was doing self-mining at home, moving up to hosting, and all the way up to where he is today with owning the entire facility. You're going to want to stay tuned for the whole episode. And with that, I hope that you enjoy today's discussion with Jeff Holtz. This show is brought to you by Foreman, the official miner management software of the Watson Blocks podcast. Foreman is the leader in Bitcoin miner management software. Guys, this software suite is absolutely incredible. Not only can you automate your curtailment program and cost avoidance, which yes, those are two different strategies, but you can also manage all of your inventory from one clean dashboard. Whether you're trying to avoid peaks or executing a block strategy or needing to manage three to infinity miners, Foreman can handle all of this for you. They are the software stack that will scale up with your operation as you continue to add more megawatts and complexity to your power strategy. Seriously, guys, the best way to get a full understanding of the capabilities of Foreman is to head over to their website right now, sign up today, because it's free up to 25 miners. Seriously, you didn't hear that wrong. It's absolutely free up to 25 miners. Go get signed up today and get started managing your miner fleet like the pros today at foreman.mn. That's F-O-R-E-M-A-N dot M-N. Foreman dot M-N. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Like I said in the introduction, I am here with Jeff, and we are going to get into all sorts of fun uh, Bitcoin mining. I'm sure we're going to touch on hunting in the discussion. I'm sure we're going to, yeah, we're, we're going to get into all sorts of stuff today. Jeff, welcome to the show. Well, uh, hey, it's not just me. Dot's here too. Dot's here. Oh, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, Jeff, it's funny. We haven't met in person, but what I do know about you is that where there is you, Dot is also with you. So it's, uh, I should have, I should have known better. Yeah, about ninety nine percent of the time, uh, there's a few things I got to go do where I leave her at home. But uh, when I'm when I'm out traveling, she's more dog than the wife feels comfortable taking care of. And and uh, when I'm traveling, I'm usually hunting anyway. So there you go. Yeah, so she's she's a uh, she's a bird dog, right? That's I mean most most people that know you know you're you're out bird hunting in what all fifty all all the all the states. Have you hunted bird in all the states yet? Not yet. Um, about 15 years ago, I read a book called A Hunter's Road. And uh, it was a sports writer who focused on birds, took a six-month trip uh, from Colorado to Wisconsin to Maine, down through Texas and back home over a six-month period. And he chronicled all these great bird hunts that he went on. Now, he was connected, right? So he's a bird rider. So he didn't go to any dud kind of places. He went to all the good ones. But sure. it was an inspiring story. And uh, so I set a goal to hunt birds in all 50 states and 20 countries before I die. And uh, I got a bird dog and uh, hunted that Brittany for 10 years. And it started, you know, two weeks at a time, then three weeks. And then 
I wore that dog out and got this one. And now we're, uh, I set the record this year. We were on the road for three months. Um, and it was, it was glorious. <laughs> wow. It was just wow. glorious. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, I, I I told you right before we hit record, I'd probably ask you a little bit about that. I, you know, when I look at like most people get into hunting, they start, you know, their dad brings them out hunting and it's kind of really from childhood there on out, you know, they're, they're off often hunting. Mine was a little bit unconventional in that sense where I started hunting seven years ago, I think. Nice. And predominantly whitetail deer. I'm up in, you know, everyone, everyone's heard by now I'm up in Minnesota. Um, we have a little bit of pheasant, some turkey. Yeah. No, you got some good pheasants. Um, oh, we do? Iowa, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I'll be there Thanksgiving week next year, uh, tune in the mine. And so I haven't shot one in Minnesota. The mine's only like an hour south of Minnesota. So I'm uh, Minnesota's on the list for next year. We'll connect and uh, we'll get you on a pheasant hunt. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, I know I know that there's good birds in fe- or there's good pheasant in Iowa. So uh, I they don't they don't like <laughs> No, they're terrible. Yeah, you're right. There's <laughs> hardly any of them there. They're, they're small. <laughs> and you yeah. you make a you make a great point. So I hunt uh upland and waterfowl and I'm an open invitation to hunt. So if you'd like to come hunt with me and you're around that area, uh just reach out Twitter or whatever. Um and if you're in the Austin area, I have a ranch over south of uh, north of San Antonio where we have some deer. If you'd like to shoot a deer, then you know let's have a conversation. Oh, hey, there you go. Invites out there. I'm a yeah. terrible, terrible shot. I I don't know what it is when it's moving. I can't I can't hit it. So we'll have to fix that first. Then you can take me bird hunting. <laughs> uh, you can go to there's uh, coaches are at the ranges. Just go to a range and sample it. Pay for an hour, fifty bucks, and uh, take what works and throw away what doesn't. And okay. uh, winnow through that, and you'll find yourself a good shot. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I. I. So I'm out there bow hunting for white-tailed deer. That's like bread and butter for me. That's that's like so I'll I'll spend most of my time shooting my bow. Whereas I'm sure if I spent a little bit of time, you know, shooting skeet that I, I could probably dial it in. It just, yeah, I, I tell you, if it's moving, I can't hit it. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty funny to watch. <laughs> I, I'm kind of the opposite. I'm not really good with a rifle, never was kind of stuff. And uh, shotgun works good for me most of the time. But I, you know, um, in target shooting, particularly in, in clay target shooting, you're not supposed to hit everyone. You're really not. And you're not supposed to hit every bird out there. So, you know, what good does it do to get mad about the miss, right? That's a good take. Well, I got to hit at least one, right? That's yeah. <laughs> Like I said, well, I'll, I'll get there. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, that's a, what I, we'll meet up in person pretty soon here. Like you said, you're not too far away from me. We're going to get into it. We'll we'll have we'll have actual beers um and and get into all that. So, Jeff, I'd love to start and kind of back us up here because I know that we, we've we've been riffing a little bit, but I'd love to kind of back you up. And I personally really want to hear your background. Where were you coming from prior to Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining? I, I'd love to hear that and that story and, and have you walk us through that. Sure. Uh, I started... I managed a Radio Shack when I was in graduate school in 83, 84, uh, and uh, learned how to program Trash DOS uh, Model 2. I had my own little Model 4 portable, luggable, um, and just continued on that path. I have an uh, MS and an MBA in ag economics, and I'm not involved in ag to speak of. I uh, worked for insurance companies and uh, programming or IT director for four years. Uh, sorry, six. And then got hired by an IT consulting company uh, and worked for them for two years. And then in 94, got uh, hired by a startup here in Texas and came home. Uh, prior to that, I'd been wandering sure. around and doing that kind of stuff. And so largely self-taught um, uh, and had a proficiency for it. Uh, worked in that startup and then started my own in 2000 doing uh locally managed offshore software testing and lo- uh lo- sorry what one more one more time jeff locally what managed, was it managed locally yeah. managed offshore software testing okay and uh 
still own that company today. Uh, the original plan for that was to, like every entrepreneur, build it to some great sum of money and then sell it. The only problem with that is either uh, you take their shitty stock, you get some kind of uh, crappy earn out when you don't have control, or you get cash. And, you know, 2008 taught me that, you know, the buddies with bonds are going to get bailed out. And if you're not one of the buddies, you're not going to get bailed out. And the yeah. kind of the conventional wisdom was, you know, you take cash from from your exit and you put it in bonds and you draw it down at 4%, right? Um, but man, 2008 scared me. And yeah. I didn't know what to do. But I did know and, and was uh, in a part of a CEO roundtable group um, at that time. And I just changed the business from... Uh, from a company to a business. And, and uh, the, the difference is that I quit focusing on uh, terminal value and exit value and started focusing on uh, cash flow and sustainability. And uh, sure. Then I uh, guess in 2011, the, my barber had a subscription to Playboy. And uh, I was reading an article about gawker and silk road and i just got it like i understood what bitcoin was immediately oh wow. and uh <clears throat> and so started accumulating it uh, just a little bit here and there it's like you know the, the story why didn't you get more it's like dude i wired a hundred dollars to china hoping for some digits on my phone <laughs> yeah uh, well, that's oh, why yeah. that's yeah, why yeah 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 um the the beauty was at that time, right, there were so many different ways to get and all of them were hard, right? And so local bitcoins or whatever Charlie Shrem was running at the time, or I you know, I, I could understand what I read in Bitcoin talk, um, but uh it didn't I didn't really get it at that time. Uh sure. and the other good info was over on Reddit, right? And so I was just trying to learn and learn and learn. Um, and, uh, I just liked accumulating. It kept going up. Um, and, uh, I can remember when Coinbase came on and, and, uh, and then finally they got the auto DCA turned on. I literally had a calendar reminder to go buy Coinbase. Every oh, month yeah. morning. <laughs> there you go. So that I could do my DCA. Um, and, uh, I got interested in mining. Um, I just, you know, the, <clears throat> in the old days, I say in the old days, Back when the marketing guys used to say, you know, teach their kids and the students in advertising that advertising is a money making machine. You know, you put in a nickel and you get out a dime. That's mm -hmm. marketing and advertising. Uh, and uh, I kind of got that, but man, when I saw Bitcoin miners, I knew that was a money making machine, and I just wanted a part of that. Um, I I like the network. I like uh, having to solve the problems, figure it out. Um, yeah. It was like the old days when, you know, we were on BBSs trying to to find drivers and shit like that, right? I probably use terms that nobody understands anymore. <laughs> but it was a puzzle to figure out. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was a fantastic puzzle to figure out. Um I tried in the interim many, many times to uh mine on a CPU. Um and I just couldn't get it working. Uh and I didn't have time in the evening. I was running one company and I just bought another one uh that did educational software. So um when you know being able to buy an S9 or horribly a dragon like I bought, um oh. that that was a game changer for me. Yeah. You know, I could yeah. just plug it in. Yeah. What um so was it like just physically figuring out how to get the the ASICs, the Bitcoin miners to to work? Is that what you liked about because you mentioned that you, you liked the the problem solving? Was it the problem solving of that or did you like the, the computational effort that the, the Bitcoin miners were actually doing? I, I like that it, it uh, presented a. A puzzle that was an opportunity, right? Here's your box, plug it in, now figure it out. Right. And then, well, what does this do? And what does this do? Right. Um, yeah. And that it, it presented a puzzle that that if you you could figure it out on your own the hard way. But if you went digging and meeting people and asking questions, you could uncover all kinds of great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, one. Well, I mean, when I first started, I would. Similar sort of I mean, it was a lot of Reddit for me. Um, there was a gentleman named Rolf Versluis. On, yeah, on yeah. YouTube. Yeah. yeah like Rolf. Rolf. Yeah. 
he was actually I, I got to meet him in person and I just I turned into a total fangirl. He was at the Texas blockchain event and uh in Fort Worth just recently and I, I ran in I had to stop him. Um but yeah, it was a lot of a lot of Reddit, a lot of uh Rolf's videos, um, especially on the the electrical, like the infrastructure side. Cause boy, did he yeah. he is just super knowledgeable guy um on, on all that. Yeah. I'd be curious when you, so, all right. So you, you found Bitcoin, you got it immediately. I love that you found it in a Playboy. That's, that's hilarious. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, light bulb moment with the Bitcoin mining. Did you start with a couple in your, in your house? So, you know, again, me and, and a lot of people you hear, it's like, oh yeah, you, you buy a couple of these. Unfortunately, um, Dragon was, it sounded like was one of the first ones that you bought um, was <laughs> some of those. Um, did you plug them in at home? How'd you, how'd you like start, start with the, the Bitcoin yeah. miners? You know, I was just thinking, and, and, and this conversation begs the question, does anybody have just one miner? <laughs> I don't not. think so. No, no. <laughs> a, well, maybe very, very briefly. Yeah. For like, right, you know, just yeah. a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's what it was like. That's what it was like. Okay. I'm uh, fortunate that I have a, a little guest house that uh, we never have guests. It's an old one um, that had a hundred amp panel in it. And uh, so I started plugging them down there uh, as many as I could fit and just ran with those for a while. Um, they were problematic. Um, and uh, so then uh, the M20s came out, 68 terahash. Woo, that was nice. Mm-hmm. Like, man, that's four times what I was just oh, yeah. mining with. Yeah. And, it was hard and to, I think it's hard I to, think it, I was going to say, it was hard I to keep it, a handle on the increase in efficiencies on those, on those ASICs back in the early days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I was telling my wife or something, somebody the other day, like, I can remember when S9s were, or these dragons were uh, turning, you know, over 200,000 sats a day. <laughs> and now we're, what, 23 if we're lucky? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and, uh, but I, I think I got to probably six or eight down in the casita and, and uh, realized I wanted more. And um, just set a goal. We're like, I want to have a megawatt of miners. And the reason I want to have a megawatt of miners is that they're going to earn Satoshis for me for as long as possible. And so I just want, you know, um, to be able to mine and get my fair share for as long as I possibly can. And, sure. uh, and that matched up with, with everything else, right? So I'd reset goals in life, right? So you change your business from an exit to a sustainable, right? Well, I, everything else kind of changes. Um, and so uh, that fit really well. You know, I hear I have a, a, these two companies and my, my teams are running them well, and I can see a future there where, where they continue to run them. And there's not a whole lot I can mash on the gas pedals on a 20 year old software testing company or a 15 year old educational software company. And being an entrepreneur, if I don't have something to do, I'm going to get in trouble. Yep. And so this provided an outlet for creativity and systems building and stuff like that. And it allowed me to give an appropriate level of attention to my businesses so that they thrive and sustain and contain all of my monkey business over here in the mining world. Um, <laughs> And so, I, and it wasn't long. I didn't noodle on that long. I uh, immediately started. So my strategy, my 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 strategy was to accumulate the machines in hosting. Um, mm, okay. And and then by the time I hit the three hundred mark, then it would be time to get into a container and either you know on cheap electricity or even just fully jump to to gas um, and some kind of partnership with the natural gas genset. Um, that was thinking at the time, um, man, I was a year behind. I got to 200 and, uh, the hosting deal started unwinding underneath me. Um, and I, I mean, I couldn't even mm-hmm. keep 200 running while I was trying to get the damn mine built. Um, and so mm-hmm. I was a year behind, um, and, uh, uh, but knew I needed to do it. And I was talking to my buddy Jeff and he said, Hey, I read on the compass gripe telegram group that there's cheap electricity in Iowa. Let's go look. And we did. Oh, wow. Uh, Just like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I like, I got shit deteriorating in hosting and I'm, you know, not a good situation. And, uh, 
So, and Jeff had, his dad had a farm there. And so it, like location would be solved. It's, you know, it's a little bit of a uh, Bob Burnett's trilemma type of thing. Right. So yep. capital, cheap power, and um, I guess miners. Um, yep. So uh, we got, it sounded good. Uh, the power code that we were talking to. Um, and then once the actual account people got in rather than the salespeople, you know, from like six cents to nine or 10 variable. And we're like, well, this shit won't work. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, so I, I didn't even know the difference pub co to co-op at that point in time, but I looked around and I've always been a co-op customer cause I grew up in the country and still live in the country. So I understand co-ops. Um, and I looked in Iowa has a bunch of them and, um, you know, there's the the first thing that they teach you in marketing classes is an association for everything. Yep. And uh, the, lo and behold, there is an association of Iowa uh, rural co-ops. <laughs> Iowa, like I A E C, something like that. Anyway, yeah. um, I tried with their their CEO, you know, being full of piss and vinegar and all, and got no answer whatsoever. Um, but then I went in and uh, I was like, well, there's the members there. Let's figure out their email addresses. And so I got I hired a guy on Upwork to do all that scraping and stuff and and uh, sent out 33 or 34 emails and literally put Bitcoin in the subject line and some kind of nice, uh, hey, I'd like to talk to you, yeah. I'm a small miner and this kind of thing. And and out of 33 or 34 of them, three of them actually answered me. I say that they, they didn't press the delete, immediately press the delete <laughs> button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, keep going. So um, uh, we talked with them and, and, and actively engaged with all of them. Turn, to come to find out, they were all uh, uh, members of a larger co-op um, that was interested. Um, and so their only difference would be, you know, geographic location and maybe a difference in in uh, what portion of the infrastructure they would pay for, pulling wires, how much they'd pay for, and what your facility charges. But it's it's it, it's negligible. You're everything's come all your costs are upstream yeah um the i selected this one because they had a transformer for me um and uh like i, I there, there's risk but it, it lowered my capital getting in because i didn't have to buy that transformer right uh yep. guaranteed if they need it somewhere else they're gonna come get it um my only hope is that if i pull more power through it than somebody else's quote unquote emergency need then maybe they'll go grab another one instead of mine <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> Um, they, uh, we talked a lot, like, why do you want to do this? Um, they, uh, Garrett, uh, the CEO of this REC went back and worked with Corn Belt, which is the, the co-op above that. And I can explain that kind of stack if you want. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll get into and that. They, they, they came up with a, a, a tariff rate for us called the bit miner rate. <laughs> So we have a, a tariff called the bit miner rate, uh, but it was, it was very attractive um, uh, under five and a half. Um, and. Uh, oh, you're giving all the I secrets really, of IOA now, Jeff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, uh, I, dude, there's spots. I can't build I know, them out. There's spots for the right people. Uh, happy to. Yeah. In fact, I uh, was met a guy on telegram that listened to the other one that said, Hey, any more? And I said, yes. Um, yep. And so still in touch with those other two guys, other two co-ops because they're, they want a minor. Um, there's a big hickey in that with a potential rate, rate change that's coming next summer. So if you'll remind me, I'll tell you about that. Um, so the, the next part is location and that's hard. It's hard. Um, our play to the co-op uh, was that, it doesn't, we're looking for a substation with excess capacity and a location as close as possible to that. Yeah. So it really doesn't cost the co-op anything to, ha to have us come in. There's a cost sharing that they'll do with you on the wires from their pole to your transformer. Now, um, on, on that, Jeff, is that like they'll... Like you, you initially pay for it and then they'll start discounting on your, your bill to buy those cables back from you or cause, cause some groups will do that too. I'm just curious if that, that's what these guys were doing with you. It's, it's different for each co-op and you need to sit down and talk with the, yeah. the external supervisor and who puts together the estimates and the costs 
and then the CEO and office manager about, you know, what that's going to look like. Um, and it's going to be a little bit different with each one, depending on how they value as a customer and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Okay. But um, the, our, pro our promise is, uh, Little, literally no cost to get us in. And some will make you pay for the meter. Mine don't make me pay for the meter, right? So there's all kinds of different things. Um, but the, the BIMS is like, there's no cost to you guys to come in, for us to come in and start writing you big checks. Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, Jeff, I, I want to pull you kind of all the way back in, in that story. Um, like you, you said, I think you, you mentioned it as you're an entrepreneur and you've got these these two businesses already up and running. You needed something to 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 kind of help you stay out of trouble. Um having started a business and then bought the second business, and and then you said you you sort of touched on it with like you kind of mapped out what the business was gonna look like for all this. Did you like how were you evaluating Bitcoin mining? So I know you said how many sats possible. But did you like, did you build out uh, a big old spreadsheet that helped you forecast the Bitcoin? You're, you're, you're laughing as I say that, but I'd love Dude, to hear I, how you like, how'd you map that out? I modeled the snot out of it so many oh, different you did, okay. ways. Oh God, I okay. did. I, I, I had to model it as a business. So I, I, I look at it from kind of two different standpoints. So, so it is a business from an operating yeah. standpoint. It's got an entity. It's got bank accounts. Um, it has transactions. It pays taxes, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Um, the difference, and this came out of my CEO groups, is, is talking about is a as a business owner or entrepreneur, what do you have to leverage, right? And because that's what, that's it. Otherwise, you just work for yourself. You sell your time, right? Right. After that's that, right. it's gaining some leverage. And that's what we do in business is that we uh, amass resources and apply leverage, right? And so, um, and, and leverage gives you some benefits, but they all have some cost, right? And so one of the biggest forms of leverage is your customers. We love selling to existing customers because the cost of selling to them is zero. You're talking yep. to them anyway, right? Um but Bitcoin mining doesn't have any customers. We're price takers, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a benefit in that in that I don't need any customer support lines. I have zero cost involved in customer support because I have no customers. I'm a price taker. Yeah. So the other thing that we leverage specifically is employees, right? We, so we leverage their time. They sell their time to us and we keep a portion of that and, and mass and leverage that. And, and, uh, but this, this business doesn't have any employees either. It's got me. Well, not many, not many. Yeah. No, yeah. it's me, me. Right. Sure. Sure. Um, sure and so, yeah. so those, but and all that to say is that, that one of the reasons that I've been successful over time sustainably um, is the ability to uh, build systems that work and recognize the goals and the constraints. Right. And so one of the constraints for this is you don't have any customers. There's nothing to leverage there and you have to take a price, whatever they pay you. The other one is you're never going to have any employees. So you have to design the business so that it doesn't need or expect employees. And so it's just got a fundamentally different design as an operating business entity. Uh, in my head from how do I treat it relative to the other two businesses, it looks more like managing a retirement portfolio than it does mm -hmm. anything else. Yeah. And, okay. and when, when, when I get, you know, uh, profits or distributions from the other businesses, I, you know, I need money to live on. So I pay those expenses, but then, you know, I, and I'm old, right? So the older you get, the scareder you get about not running out of money. So you save more and more. It's, it's all backwards, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> but I get these profits now. And so little, and, and what am I going to do? Put it in a savings fund? No, I'm not going to stay in cash. So I kind of have three choices. I can buy Bitcoin, I can buy a miner, or I can buy a place to put a miner. And and I go through those choices, you know, as it comes in. And right now, um, I'm I, and I build these out of cash flow. I I built a giga with some Bitcoin leverage. It got macked real hard on that shit. So I'm just building the rest of it out of cash flow. And that's why the the smaller containers uh, work for me, right? Uh, it's sure. cheaper to buy an eight by eight, three fifty kilowatt than it is to buy another one megawatt giga. Yeah, hmm? yeah. And I suppose it affords you some modularity too, right? You know, you, you don't have to. Yeah, that's. Uh, it ticks the box for some optionality in the future. Let's see if we need that or it's available when we do. <laughs> yeah. And now a quick word from our sponsor. 
This show is powered by Giga Energy. Giga Energy is a vertically integrated Bitcoin mining company that manufactures all of the electrical infrastructure needed to start mining Bitcoin. Whether that's medium voltage switchgear, PDUs, or power cables for your miners, the team at Giga Energy has you covered. Reach out to their sales team today for all of your electrical infrastructure needs at sales at gigaenergy.com. Use the word hash rate for the subject of the email and you'll get 5% off your order. All right, now back to the show. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I hear you. So it's, I, and I ask about the, like the modeling and, and looking at it, you know, from an actual business because, um, you know, obviously you have your publicly traded Bitcoin mining companies and I know that they put pen to paper and map this thing out as a business, but there, there are a lot of people that will just kind of wing it. Um, so I was just curious how you were like, what your, your mental model was as you were kind of starting up, you know, couple my, in the guest my, house hosting, et cetera. Yeah. So, so the, uh, the difference for me, um, is that I'm really, really clear on what this enterprise's goals are, which is to accumulate as many Satoshis as possible. Pubco miners have a different goal. They're maximizing their stock price. That's a completely yeah. different game. It's just yeah. a completely different game, right? And so uh, they, they do things um, in support of that strategy and goal, and I do things in support of my strategy and goal. Um, and so a perfect example, um, if you're going to if you're gonna have a mine without any employees, it has to work fully remotely. And, and yeah. I spent a good year piloting the, a remote mine control system down in my uh, casita. And oh, learned cool. a ton, a yeah. ton, a ton of lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I, uh, when we curtail, when we, when we turn our machines off, I turn them off at the outlet. I don't use the minor software to put them into sleep mode. And there's two reasons for that. One of them is that sleep mode still burns 180 Watts and, and we're paying $22 and change over kilowatt hour that we burn during control. So I don't have to do that. I don't want to. Um, it's another layer of software and I was never really confident, uh, in getting them all to control quickly, uh, using their software and another software management tool. Um, yeah. and so For using Foreman. it just fit, uh, I was at the time, uh, yeah. and, and used Foreman for a long, long time until, uh, it wouldn't find my device mix and I couldn't get support to get that problem solved. So that was the compelling event for me to switch over to Lincoin agent. Gotcha. So yeah. I, and I'm, I'm, I'm super fascinated by the whole like automation and just being able to remotely control it. Were you, so it sounds like you're probably using smart PDUs then since you're turning off at the outlet. You have or, to, you have to. Yeah. What no, about, you have to use uh, automa- yeah. What about like a, like a shunt on the main breaker or do you ever look into like a main breaker kill switch type thing? You're shaking yeah. your head. No. Yeah, it's real expensive, and I couldn't come up with a situation where that would be the juice was worth a squeeze. When you say super expensive, maybe I just I don't even maybe I'm totally out of touch with it. Do you remember how much something like that was when you were? I'm asking you this. I'm I'm personally and selfishly very interested in in that type of remote shut off. Equal to the price of the breaker, if not more expensive. Hmm. Okay. Think about it. It's it needs the same mechanics. Doesn't need the same uh uh current control, but needs the same physical mechanics. Right? How about um now I'm guessing you looked at the cost of all of the smart PDUs like on a on a almost apples to apples comparison in, in the cost of that that shunt? Is it the same? Or it's, I mean, I'm, it sounds like the, the smart PDUs are a cheaper route, kind of all, all totaled up. They were for me. Okay. They were for me. Um, and, and it worked out well. I ran them too hot and had some problems with some of them. And, uh, you know, if I'd have done that with the shunt or hit the breaker, the full breaker that hard, you know, it would have cut down all, it would have shut down all of them till I could do the replacement. 
So one of the things too to look at is if you so what what kind of shunt um there there so uh there's a power right an old power right that they can radio control uh a master switch on your transformer um oh to shut you down yeah the, our our co-op doesn't offer that anymore uh but they have the uh signal to turn you on and off at the literally at the transformer level um but that's a big that's a shunt or a switch that, that yeah yeah um, yeah 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 is that and uh what yeah i mean i guess would that would you see something like that as as not a, a good option if if you're if you're if your uh co-op provided that would you take that instead of doing the smart pdus or do you like having that control at the outlet I wouldn't do it instead of the smart PDUs, but I would take it at the drop of a hat because it transfers all the risk from me to them. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. It sounds like a good deal to me. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like a good deal to me because um, I know some of them do that. Yeah, no, I just those are some selfish questions. I uh, most most people that that listen to the show know I also work at at Gig Energy, so those are those are things I'm personally very interested in. Is how do we you know how can we bring that value to customers with their infrastructure uh because curtailment's a, a big thing so it's uh it's yeah. a big piece of the business uh we've been spot on the the whole time uh there's a little bit of custom programming um uh we use the the orient pdus they're fine i i, I like okay. them and all right <laughs> and uh, i i you know i don't need mechanical switches nor have i been sold and pitched on any new pdus for my impending deals you guys Giga may not want me back as a customer. I may be one of those on the. No, the no, no, no. No, no, no. no. <laughs> no, no. That's not the case. The ass. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not an easy even. customer, but I'm a grateful and valuable one. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, my plan is to continue to roll with what I have, uh, yeah. because that gives me replacement capabilities. Um, and like I said, I've I've run those old breakers. Uh, I PDU's too hard. And Amber's been great uh, getting me spare parts and stuff like that. Um, I'd love to learn more about you know what what Gig is doing. Um, but again, yeah, yeah. see a, a different set of goals, right? And so I'm trying to economize and slip through because it's my money, right? And like, that's right. Not all miners are spending their money. Sometimes they're spending somebody else's. Yeah, a lot of them either raise privately or uh they're they're raising publicly through stock dilution. Yeah, it's uh yeah. uh not not intending to be some type of a sales pitch for you, Jeff. Well, I what I'd love to do is is chat with you again over that beer that we're going to have in person and and I'll just, you know, maybe it maybe it looks like I, I get you a PDU to to kind of test out and uh see what you think type of thing. We we can we can we can chat about that too. So, um Excellent. All right. I want to hear a little bit more about this curtailment program with the, with the co-op. How do you know how many hours out of the year you're down and off that, like off the cuff, I know I'm asking you, asking you out of the blue. I don't know if you've got that in front of you or if you remember, like, is it a lot of curtailment or, or not no, a lot? No, 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 no. no. Uh, and we've got it tuned. Um, and so the curtailment programs are going to vary by co-op. And they are uh, subject to the curtailment programs uh, from their generation and distribution co-op, generation transmission co-op. Uh, and so what ours looks like is that half of the year um, in the summer, uh, we have uh, a period in the afternoon from like one o'clock until eight o'clock when uh, they can, when we're subject to control. The rest of the time, we're not. In the winter, there's two periods. There's a morning period from about 6 to 10 and an afternoon period from like 5 to 8 when they can control. Okay? Everything else in, outside of those, they cannot control. Okay. So there's only certain windows that we have to be aware of the control signal. Um, the way that we work is that that uh, the co-op publishes a uh, system demand percentage number, and it varies every minute or so. And we read that, and when it goes above a set point, um, the scripts uh, go to the PDUs and turn, they say all off, 
and the PDUs will try and turn everybody off, but you know it's a noisy network for HTTP API calls. And so the script just stays on it and mm. hammers them off until they're all off, right? Um, okay. Again, what you can do in your own control software that you can't do in somebody else's. Um, and and we, we have uh, one second shutdown on them. So they're, they're down within two minutes to, to zero. Um, in the Giga container, our electronics and all our 120 volt stuff uh, are run off of a completely separate circuit. So uh, we could turn off the whole transformer there, but it, it doesn't make sense to do it when it's just easily done and monitored at the outlet level. Remember, anything that you want to control, you also have to be able to read and, and make sure it did what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> my, my big lesson in developing that, that set of control scripts, uh, the guy calls it MindBrain, um, was that it's an IoT problem, not a, a, a regular programming problem. And mainly because of the questionable availability of every resource that you make a request of you know apps on your machine they're all right there right everything's there and as long as you got internet but you know you may have some recalcitrant heat sensor that's not giving you any information well what do you do then and you yeah. got to be able to think through all that kind of stuff and get that built out and we're still building i we we still find features anyway when it hits that set point uh we'll turn everything off and then we'll wait to we have two set points so that we don't bounce. Um, and so we'll wait to come below the off point down to a lower on point and we'll kick on. We're still bouncing. We tuned it for the summer, but I, it may need a little bit more width because we're bouncing a little bit uh, in the mornings. Um, OK, we controlled twice this morning, um, like for 30 minutes. And then uh, it said to come back on. But. Uh, apparently everybody decided to come back on because it went red again. So we had to turn off and then wait a little bit and then turn back on. Okay. So we try and prevent the bounce. I call that bouncing, right? So try and be crisp on your, your off and your on. Um, sure. Uh, when you say everybody's bouncing, you mean the, the co so does the co-op have like a dashboard then that you're watching that says, Hey, everybody turn off like everyone that's in this program and you're in the controllable period, that controllable window. It's, it has, know, like page, under, it has a web yeah, page with a percentage number on it. Okay. 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 Got it. Yeah. Okay. It uh, also cool. has, it, it also has colors, red, yellow, green, but we can't control, you can't control a mine on that. We need the percentage number. Um, and we've been highly accurate. Uh, we really haven't blown through any control periods to speak of. Okay. Um, so, on the topic of those control periods, the fact that you're pretty crisp and and on the jump and not not you know probably not taking a whole ton of penalty because you mentioned you've got like a twenty two dollar it's it's probably per kilowatt you know sure. penalty on that yeah so I mean you you're really getting slapped in the face if you miss these Hard. these control periods. What's the co op think of all this? I know they were excited to have you. They were one of the the three that responded, but like. Are they happy with how things are going? Do, are they curious about all this? Like, what what are you hearing from the co ops? Uh, cautiously curious. Okay. Um, I I was really fortunate that before we ever turned on, and right after they gave approval, the board, the the co op board, um, they asked to meet me. And Garrett said, I think that'd be a good idea. So I went up there and uh, had lunch with them before their board meeting and just kind of told my story and answered their questions. And and uh, uh, they didn't change their mind. Um, they continue to be uh, quite happy, uh, helpful beyond measure. Uh, it's, it's a great cooperation. They uh, they there was a, a clause that I didn't notice. Uh, that could have cost us a thousand dollars for inactivity. We hooked up a little bit. We we initiated the account on the second mine a little bit too early, and mm. it was inactive for a month. And the, the system billed me a thousand dollars. And I just asked Garrett. It was like I didn't realize it. Yeah, it's way down here, but we'll waive it because I know what you guys are doing. Um, oh wow! You don't get that. You don't get that. No. Oh no. no. Uh, 
Well, really and so here, here, here's how here's how it, it works on the other side. So there, uh, I did run it in in the last half of September and uh, all of October, and their meter was broken. I got a zero bill the next month, and I said, "Hey, this isn't right. We're not full up, but we've been running." And uh, they said, "Well, we, you know, the meter must be broken." So they didn't get it fixed until the fifth of November, and and they said, "I said." what should we do? And they go, well, we can't measure it. So we can't charge you. And I said, well, I have all this data on my PDUs. How about I tell you how much we used? And they said, Oh, that wow. would be great. And so, so we did that for the month of October and then kind of the first week of, of uh, November. Well, I, if, if I didn't do that, you know, so the cool thing about co-ops is they don't keep a profit, right? They redistribute all the excess at the end. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of thing would just be socialized to all the other members. Well, I, I, don't I well, and I mean, I, the other thing about it, Jeff, is you the experience you're giving them is not some of the. There was a, a particular co-op up here in Minnesota who's had some really bad experiences with Bitcoin mining groups, and so I mean, you're just you're giving them this experience that, yeah, it, it's allowing them nothing other than to feel comfortable working with you because mm-hmm. you're you're honest, you're upfront. Um, uh, that's that's incredible. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just like it's the kind of folks that I want to do business with. I, in my other two companies, we uh, are very leery about doing business with large companies, just because we don't have that many layers of infrastructure ourselves to match up with all the busybodiness that happens. Right? Give me a couple mm-hmm. of people that actually do some shit. Let's talk and get something done. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, you know yeah. the co-op's great. So. <laughs> There's a I tell so many stories about it, but one of the so many things I didn't think through. So you got to change filters, and filters come in these two foot by two foot by two foot cardboard cubes, and I need eleven of them to put in the Giga. Well, it's where are you going to get that delivered to? Well, filters, I'm, 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 yeah. Where where are you going to get that delivered to the blue box on the hill at 90th and Mallard? Uh, <laughs> Amazon says no. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah, it's yeah, well, it's a little it's, it's a little thing you wouldn't think of. Yeah. So what what totally, you do? Totally. Totally. Yeah. I asked could I deliver to the co-op? Well, they say yeah, they got a big old warehouse. They held it for me. They have a wash bay so that I can wash my screen. Um wow. I, it, yeah, I, it's like it's 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 in the country. It's kind of like where I grew up and the folks I want to do business with. That's incredible. I you, you mentioned you mentioned something else that I'm well I, I'd love to circle you back because you, you mentioned that that you, you did have some things that you learned along the way I think maybe to kind of round out the the rest of the episode here it'd be fun to to kind of walk through some of those learnings but do you happen to know Jeff you you mentioned it again super briefly that as a co-op they have to distribute all profit like they they don't they don't yeah what they well don't, yeah think, well it's a board decision allowed, it's a it's a board decision subject to the, their incorporation constitution, uh, but yeah. they don't, they don't hold excess reserves. They distribute excess reserves. That's what it is. And, and maybe it's just a function of, we'll need to send this episode to your co-op and, and say, Hey guys, Ben, Ben has some questions. He'd really love to talk to you about. Cause I, I'd love to hear, you know, how, how they go through that process. Cause I think another function of, regulated utilities is if they make over their cap of profit, they have to give it back to the public too, which is potentially troublesome for some utility companies. I don't know what they do. They fill it up with bullshit expenses. You know, they've been real closed mouth about that whole process. Okay. And, and it's Iowa. So, you know, man, you got to slide into it gently. Sure. Yeah, and I, I don't need the secret sauce to anybody's, <laughs> you know. I I don't need any of that. I'll, I'll, I'll have more. I'll have more data in February or March. <laughs> sure, <laughs> and, sure. Ch- and checking my hand. <laughs> well, so that's what I'm. That's what I'm. I'm interested to know is like how you know it's 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 extremely cool to me that they're excited and cautiously interested in in having Bitcoin miners come onto their their system. But then how does that also interact with the the profitability 
with respects to the return that they have to give back. Cause I, I had an individual in a conversation that wasn't, wasn't an episode or a recording, but he shared that a big potential problem for regulated markets, bringing Bitcoin mining on is they're going to make too much money, which blew my mind. The, the problem yeah, that, is they're going to the make concern. the utility companies too much money. <laughs> it's like, well, that's, that that sucks. Um, you know, I, I I don't know the exact percentage, but but it's roughly ten to fifteen percent of my bill goes to the co op. Everything else is power charges. Hmm. It's not very much. It's not very much. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not expecting some grand crazy check. Um, yeah, it's not it's not very much. Uh, most of it's energy charges. And so re- related to that, um, you haven't asked, uh, but we don't have power contracts per se. Um, I'm oh. on a large commercial. I'm on their large commercial account, bit minor rate. Um, there's no um, it's month to month for all intents and purposes. Um, we had to put up a deposit uh, and it's horrible. Um, the, mm. it, it's, it's, uh, a month of the fullest of the maximum you could pay. Right. So it's ugly yeah. when you consider that $20 a kilowatt hour. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, and, ooh, yeah. that's ooh. what they're protecting against. They're not protecting against the, you know, not paying the stuff. They're p- protecting against you making a big mistake and then going, no, I'm not paying. Right. That's so, fair. That's fair. That's, that's fair. I, I understand that. Um, there, uh, so our co-op Franklin, along with Prairie and all the other, most in, in Iowa, uh, belong to an, uh, are members of a co-op called Corn Belt. And, uh, Corn Belt is known as a generation and, uh, distribution or transmission. Okay. Sorry. Gener- generation, generation transmission. And transmission. Yeah. DNT. Yeah, uh, they 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 have a couple of uh, and you can see how they socialized it from like from when it was REAs got started in the depression to all that you just follow see the map and the growth and that kind of stuff. But they separated these things out when they made Basin, and so Basin is largely generation and transmission, eight thousand megawatts. Um, the Corn Belt is a member of Basin Co-op, so you can just go look these up, right? So Basin Co-op sure, is so the it's Uber. Kinda... Yeah. Power provider, yeah, up in North Dakota and every all they got co ops all the way down in New Mexico, uh, and and over in Iowa. You can go to the website, and see it. But Basin is made up of all these corn belts out there, and the corn belts are made up of the Franklins and stuff where we buy our power through. Um, they last summer, uh, they kicked up a big fuss and said, We're going to put all these bit miners on a market rate, and uh. There was a lot of uncertainty. In fact, my CEO came and told me that uh, the morning that I was, you know, digging a hole to put a new pod in. Um, It was like, hey, rates are going to (laughs) change. They put off anything in the in the in the corn belts of the world and the Franklins of the world are really frustrated with with Basin. But what's underneath the the that the core of their fear, my understanding is that uh, Basin is concerned about a transient. desire for long-term generation. They don't want to build generation assets for bit miners that may only be here four or five years. And so they're, okay. they're saying, look, all bit miners, we're going to buy your power at market rate. Uh, but they haven't put together anything. They're working on something. So we're subject to rate changes you know, at any time where we are. Hmm. I the suppose that's the, the, yeah. the only benefit we have there is that the, our co-ops are fighting tooth and nail for us. They want us. They see the value. Um, we're uh, like we, we don't ask for anything, and we'll come write big checks. Yeah. Well, what I what I'm failing to understand, and you said Basin. I forget that's. I forget the full name of that that generation and transmission Basin, company. Basin Power Basin Power Cooperative. Okay. Thank you. Um, mm-hmm. What I failed to not see, or what I'm failing to understand, is that. They're they're saying that they don't want short term customers, and and what they said was three to five years. But I'm sure they have to build out more generation. I mean, who's going to be the customer otherwise? You know, it's 
take take the customer it's, when you have it, right? I, I it's <laughs> so so go look at the about us page on the basin board of directors page. Okay. And you'll quickly understand why they're reticent to build more generation. Interesting. Particularly in the particularly in the sizes that Bitcoin miners are asking for, right? So they're not reacting to me asking the co-op if they have a spare megawatt and a half on this subject. That you're talking like the 50 meg. Correct. Right. You, yeah, Correct. you're talking that's about the big, got them scared. the big guys, yeah. That, that's what's got them scared. That's what got them scared. So kind of the sub Rosa strategy that we're working on is that they'll give the that basin will establish a large minor rate, but let the G and T co ops like Corn Belt use their own discretion. Yeah. For 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 mines less than two megawatts. That's what we're that's that's kind of the strategy that they're working on for us. You so should we see can if they keep can do our five, rate. We can five, keep we, should... <laughs> we no, um, we can keep our rate. I, I like I said, I, I always on the table is I'll give you the switch. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, what um, could be better? You control your own variable load, right? Uh, but <laughs> so wonder, we're subject. There's all that uncertainty out there in you know in, in where we are in our power prices. Yeah, I just I just wonder if if Basin is is at a at like an impasse or or you know they're they're staring at like a fork in the road. Like we have to build more generation, which is going to cost money, and then because they have to build more generation, they want they want a reliable customer that can forecast a business model past 10 years, which that, you know, it's, uh, so I wonder if they're kind of staring. Yeah. I wonder if they're kind of staring down the barrel of that decision and that's why they're doing this. Well, yeah. 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 Well, I mean at that, at that super large load level, right. It, it, It completely makes sense. Um, and, and look at them, right? And so, I, and I learned this when you know I'm kind of researching the next when when it's when electricity is too expensive. Where do I go? And um, Daniel Batten's pursuing this and the the methane and the landfill and stuff like that, right? But and I was looking at that stuff, and I, there are no pockets or edges because those things are so expensive to build that they can't get the bonds to build them unless they've got a large percentage contractually pre-sold for a long yep. period of time yep. off takers is what they call them and i hate yeah that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh no, it's <laughs> it's a, i mean that's that's what happened to new scale um the the small modular reactor uh i mean they had to fold everything up because the only the only long you know term customer customers with an s that could take sizable amounts of power were some cities and they all turned away from it because the power rate went up and cost of the project went up. Anyways, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess, Jeff, did you, like, do you model out the, the Bitcoin mining operation longer than, than five, 10 years? You know, the thing I learned about modeling is that uh, it's absolutely worthless for predicting what's going to happen in the future. It's beautiful for to, for understanding what just happened to you, but yeah. it's just completely worthless. And that's Bitcoin's taught me that. The more that I try and apply fiat thinking or notions or that kind of stuff, the more I get just whacked hard. Hmm. And so uh, I'm very specific about this. It is like the long term goal here is to stack satoshis for as long as possible, and I'm always looking for that next cheap landing spot. Um, because I know, you know, I, it did my heart good. I can mine for under, uh, under, uh, $5 hash price, just barely, but I can get there, uh, where I am at under $5 hash price. And somebody boldly said 501 is the floor forever. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I I do have the advantage though. Like if you if they do move us to a variable power rate, right? well, I, I can turn those miners on and off. I can watch the power price just like I watch you know these guys. So you know, change the the, the game. I, that's okay because I'm set to to have the mine kind of manage itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think the other thing you're doing is you are in real time keeping, you know, the the power companies on their toes as well because 
you know, you've got containerized solution for your mining operation and you, you'll go find the next power company that, uh, that'll, that'll take you. So, um, I, just I to, know there. I know there are so many substations out there that got excess capacity. I I know. Yeah. I drive by them on my hunting trips. Yep. Oh yeah. Uh, Otter Tail Power up in. Uh, they're kind of on the the outskirts of Minnesota, up in the North Dakota, South Dakota. They won't get into the power rate that you're talking about, but it'll be it'll be steady. Uh, and they got a lot of. I, I talked to Kevin Quova over at Otter Tail. He's part of their economic development and. They've got some pockets that'll take you. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Jeff, just to, to keep a tab on the time, I I, I know it's uh, it's Monday. You're you're being gracious with your time, so I won't won't keep you for too much longer. But I was curious. I'd love to hear you've you've mentioned it several times. This is kind of the retirement plan. This is the goal. Sack. Let me try that again. Stack as many sats as possible. Do you have like? Are you going to scale up? Is are you going to to five megawatts? Are you maybe just share like what's the you know we we know the end goal stack as many as possible, but are you going to grow with the network like most people do? Like what what's the what's the future look like? This site uh, has capacity for just under two megawatts, and uh, I'll, I'll fill that capacity. Um, I would help somebody build another. Um, I don't want another one. Um, I want to run these machines. These are all S19, uh, and and they'll replace them. You know, th- most of mine are oh, J Pro 104s and 110 Pro uh, 110 Pros. Um, I somewhat minors. Um, no, I I don't want to. Uh, feel like it's a job. I still love going up there, but now, you know, it, it's going to take two days to change and wash filters. Right. And, yeah. uh, and that's hard. It, it's just, it's just pure hard physical work. Um, and I don't ever want to go up and plus I got an acre to keep track of. And you know what? They get on you. If you let the weeds grow, you have to keep the weeds <laughs> sprayed down in Iowa wow. or they, there's a man, the County supervisor will come tell you, you need to get your weeds under control. I don't mind that. I'd like, it's okay, great. But I don't want to oh, feel doesn't. like I have to go maintain. Uh, yeah, right? I don't want to feel like I have to maintain um, somebody yeah. else's. So and probably not. It's, this is enough, and, and that's part of aging gracefully is understanding when enough is enough. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, well, I, I'm, I, semi, I'm yeah. semi-retired, and it's, I just wanted to fit in with with everything else. And and, and I, I love going up there. I, I love the people and and the friends that I make and the work that I do. So yeah, it's kind of enough. But I'd be happy to help somebody build others. And like I said, there's two more spots that I know of. Um, if you're kind of think like me and want to have that kind of Bitcoin mind, then you know, happy to help. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, Jeff. It's uh, yeah. it's uh, I I. Personally, I really like conversations like this because it's it is it's so different of an approach, and it's it's the right approach for you. It's a great approach. Like it, it's working for everybody really nicely. And 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 you know what I'm hearing you say is like, and that that's how it should be. So uh, I I love that and I appreciate that. So Jeff, I normally at the end of the show I I always leave room for my guests to you know, give a handoff. And, and if people want to get in touch with you, uh, what's the best way people can find you? Is that LinkedIn, email, Twitter, Telegram? I, I don't know what works best for you, but if you want to leave a, a handoff so folks can reach out, I, I'd, you know, happy to, happy to let you do that now. Well, thanks. Uh, J-C-H-O-T-Z on uh, Twitter and Telegram. Reach out. Happy to chat. Tell you my bullshit. Listen to yours. <laughs> <laughs> awesome jeff this has been an absolute blast i uh i appreciate it a ton and uh yeah you'll have to you'll have to get me out shooting at birds pretty soon here we'll That'd do it fun. we'll do it awesome you take care thanks man 